You'll hear two university students planning a computer programming lesson. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, Hardeep. Is now a good time for us to plan that computer programming lesson we've been assigned? Hey, Don. I was just thinking about that, actually. Yes, let's get it out of the way now, shall we? I've got the instructions here. So, it says, Design a 45-minute lesson for a class of 16 teenagers where they learn how to write a simple computer program in BASIC. Now, I know, of course, that BASIC is the computer language people used to use back in the 1980s when they wrote programs on microcomputers, but I'm not sure I feel very comfortable teaching anyone about it. Well, I did a bit of research yesterday and found out quite a few things, so I think we'll be okay. Great. So, what do you have in mind? Well, I think we should presume that none of the kids will know anything about BASIC. So, why don't we start with a short multiple-choice quiz? It could focus on things like what BASIC is, what the letters stand for, when people used it, things like that. That sounds good. I guess it shouldn't take long. Just the first five minutes of the lesson, something like that. I don't think we should make the students do it on their own, though. That'd make it too much like a test. Shall we let them do it in two so they can discuss their choices? Yes, good idea. Then we'll go through the answers with them as a whole group. Good. What next? Well, I've had an idea for the program they could write. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I think the key thing is, though, that before they actually sit at their computers, and I think we should presume that they're doing this lesson in a computer room, they make a flow chart of what they want the program to do. That's usually the best way to start writing a program. This flow chart will show all the different stages of the computer program, right? Exactly. It's probably best if the teacher stands at the board and everyone works on that together. Yes, otherwise they'll all come up with different flow charts and it'll get confusing. Precisely. I imagine making the flowchart will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Then they use that to write their computer program. Well, actually, I think there's a stage before that. You see, the flowchart will be in English. They're going to need to be taught a few basic commands so they can write their computer program. Hmm. Now I'm getting out of my depth. What kind of thing would that be? Well, for example, when you want text to appear on the screen, the command is PRINT in capital letters, followed by the text you want to appear in double inverted commas. Oh, yes. I think I've seen that before. Right. So they'll need to be taught five or six commands before they use them to write their program. Okay. So how shall we do that? With the teacher talking to the whole class again? Well, we could but it might be more fun to make it more like a competition where there are a few teams competing against each other. Each team has maybe four or five people in it and they have to do some kind of matching task. You know, they match the command print with to make text appear on the screen, something like that. That sounds good. Teenagers love competing with each other. Exactly. And then for the final part of the lesson, they use their flowchart and the commands they've learned to produce the program. Let's presume, shall we, that there are eight computers in the room, so that's two students for each computer. That sounds reasonable. So, tell me more about your idea for the computer program they're going to write. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. OK, so it's a very simple program. I've actually written it down here so we can go through it together. OK, so the first line says 10 CLS. What on earth does that mean? Well, every line of a basic computer program starts with a number. They usually go up in tens, so the first line is 10, the second 20, and so on. And CLS is the command we use in BASIC to clear the screen. Oh, I see. So that's just telling the computer to start with a blank screen. Exactly. Then we move on to the next line. So this one says 20, print, guess a number between 1 and 10. Right, I see. That appears on the screen. It's not that difficult, is it, when you get the hang of it? Let's see if I can work out the next one. 30, input I. Oh, not sure about that. Well, all that's saying is that the person playing types in a number. Input is the basic command for type in, and I just means any number you like. Oh, okay. Then what happens next depends on what the number is. So we've got 40 if I is less than 1, or if I is greater than 10. Then print, bad choice. Right. So if they type, say, 0 or 11, that appears on the screen. Exactly. And then this next line takes them back to where it asks them to type in a number between 1 and 10. That's line 50. I see. And line 60 says, if I equals 6, then print. Correct. Ah, OK. So if they've typed 6, they've got it right. And if they haven't typed 6, which is the next line, then try again comes up on the screen, and that takes them back to where they choose another number. It's clever. Well done. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about the ozone layer and CFCs. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Today, it is well known that CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons, can do immense damage to the ozone layer, which protects the Earth from harmful radiation from the sun. However, it was as recently as the mid-1970s when the connection between CFCs and ozone layer destruction was first established. The story starts back in 1957, when James Lovelock invented the electron capture detector. This is a machine that can detect very small amounts of a chemical compound in the atmosphere. Indeed, using the machine, it was Lovelock who was the first person to detect the widespread presence of CFCs in the Earth's atmosphere. In 1973, Lovelock, on a research trip which he'd funded himself, measured the amount of CFCs in the atmosphere in the Arctic and in Antarctica, but unfortunately came to the wrong conclusion that CFCs are not harmful to the environment. Following on from this work, though, in 1974, 
Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina published the very first scientific paper on the connection between CFCs and ozone depletion. This quickly prompted the world's first ban on the use of CFCs, which was enacted in 1975 by the US state of Oregon. Further bans followed. In 1978, the United States and several European countries banned the use of CFCs in spray cans. CFCs were still allowed to be used, though, for refrigeration and in solvents. It was in the mid-1980s that scientists in Antarctica observed a huge depletion in the ozone layer above them, often called the hole in the ozone layer. This led, in 1987, to the signing of the Montreal Protocol, which called for further reductions in the production and use of CFCs, and then, two years later, to a European Union agreement to ban the production of all CFCs by the end of the century. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So why exactly are CFCs so harmful? One of the reasons CFCs were so popular in the production of solvents and refrigeration coolants is that they are unreactive. That is, they don't react easily or at all with other chemical compounds. It's this property, however, that also makes them dangerous. Because they are unreactive, it's very difficult for them to be broken down. This gives them a long lifespan more than 100 years in some cases, and allows them to rise into the upper levels of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, unchanged. There, ultraviolet radiation from the sun starts to break them down, freeing the chlorine atoms from the CFCs. It's this chlorine that helps destroy the ozone there. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two students discussing a survey they have to write as an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. How is your market research project going, George? Very well, actually, Anna. I've just got the results of the survey back, and so now I have to draw some conclusions from the information I've collected. That's good. I'm still writing my questionnaire. In fact, I'm starting to panic, as the project deadline is in two weeks and I don't seem to be making any progress at all. What is your topic? Forms of transportation in the city. What about you? I've been finding out people's attitudes to the amount of violence on television. That's interesting. What do your results show? Well, as I said, I haven't finished writing my conclusions yet, but it seems most people think there is a problem. Unfortunately, there is no real agreement on the action that needs to be taken. Nearly everyone surveyed said that there was too much violence on TV, 
A lot of people complain that American police serials and Chinese kung fu films are particularly violent. The main objection seems to be that although a lot of people get shot, stabbed, decapitated, and so on, films never show the consequences of this violence. Although people die and get horribly injured, nobody seems to suffer or live with the injuries. Any children watching might take the heroes of these programs as role models and copy their behaviour. So, what did most people suggest should be done? A lot of people were concerned about how these films affect children. They are particularly worried that children will try to behave like the stars. The survey shows that violent programs should be broadcast after 10 p.m. when most children are already in bed. There is also a significant minority of people who feel that violent films should be banned altogether. Or、well, how did people feel about the violence on news broadcasts? Most of the responses I have looked at have felt that violence on news broadcasts is more acceptable as it's real. Although it's unpleasant, it is important to keep in touch with reality. Still, many people thought that it would be better to restrict violent scenes to late viewing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Your survey sounds very good. How many people filled it in? I gave out a hundred and twenty, and I got seventy back. That's a very high rate of return. Who did you give your questionnaires to? I gave a copy to every student in my hall of residence, and a few to friends from other colleges. Don't you think that this will influence your results? How do you mean? The people in your hall of residence are all about the same age. They're all students and from similar backgrounds. Therefore, it is likely that they will have similar opinions. Your results represent student opinion, not public opinion. So, how are you going to do your research? Well, I'm going to interview my respondents in the shopping mall. What I'll do is ask people if they have five minutes to spare to answer a few questions. If they agree, I will ask them some multiple choice questions and tick off their answers on my sheet. Isn't it very difficult to ask meaningful questions using multiple choice? Yes, it is. The secret to writing a successful survey is to write simple multiple choice questions that target the information you're looking for. There, it's better to write a lot of short, specific questions than longer general ones. So that's why it is taking you so long to write. Yeah, but I hope I'll be ready to start interviewing at the weekend. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Cheese is one of those foods that we tend to take for granted as always having been with us, and it's odd to think that someone somewhere must have discovered the process to make cheeses. That takes place today. In the studio to tell us all about it is Monica Maxwell. Today we all know that the process of making cheeses takes place when microorganisms get into milk and bring about changes in its physical and biochemical structure. Well, obviously we don't know who discovered the process, but it's thought that it came from Southwest Asia about eight thousand years ago. In the early time, there were mainly two types of cheeses. One of them was rather tasteless and bland. In the case of the so-called fresh cheeses, which are eaten immediately after the milk has coagulated, 
and another one was rough-tasting and salty in the case of the ripened cheeses, which are made by adding salt to the soft, fresh cheese and allowing other biochemical processes to continue so that a stronger taste and a more solid texture resulted. The ancient Romans changed all that. They were great pioneers in the art of cheese-making, and the different varieties of cheese they invented and the techniques for producing them spread with them to the countries they invaded. This spread of new techniques took place between about 60 BC and 300 AD. You can still trace their influence in the English word cheese, which comes ultimately from the Latin word Cassius, that's C-A-S-E-U-S. -E At this stage in history, people weren't aware in a scientific way of the role of different microorganisms and enzymes in producing different types of cheese, but they knew from experience that cheese's tastes were relevant to something. If you kept your milk or your pre-cheese mixture at a certain temperature or in a certain environment, things would turn out in a certain way. In the 19th century, with the increasing knowledge about microorganism, there came the next great step forward in cheese-making. Once it was known exactly which microorganism was involved in the different stages of producing a cheese, and how the presence of different microorganisms affected the taste, it was possible to introduce them deliberately and to industrialize the process. Nowadays, cheese is made on a large scale in factories, although the small producer working from his dairy farm continued to exist and still exists today. Cheese making moved very much into the world of technology and industrial processes, although because the aim is still to produce something that people like to eat, there's still an important role for human judgment. People still go round tasting the young cheese at different stages to see how it's getting on, and may add a bit of this or that to improve the final taste. Whatever the scale of production, there is still room for the development of art alongside the technology. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute. You now have half a minute to check your answers.